Hey everyone, and welcome to another Game Explained discussion. I'm John Cartwright, and I'm joined by Derek Bittner, who's had the chance to play a lot of Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. So, Derek, how long have you been playing this game for? I've been roughly playing it for around 30 hours in the main game and about another 4 or 5 hours in Future Connected. Uh, basically until I could get to the embargo points. Didn't quite reach embargo for the uh, main game itself, but definitely on Future Connected because I wanted to see as much as I could so I could tell people about it. And yeah, I've been really enjoying the game and there's... Let's put it this way, this is the definitive version. <laughs> <laughs> the title doesn't lie. Uh, I've played through the original myself, much like you have, and I've dabbled a bit in the definitive edition. No one is the extent that you have, but enough to know that they've made a bunch of small changes that really do change up the flow of the game. And there's tons of elements that make it more in line with uh, sequels like X and 2. Like, there's one very small thing that I like. Being able to also run, you can just toggle it, on, toggle it on and off so when you're going through fields you can just put down the controller and have Shulk just like rapidly run through the field on his own. Very small thing, but a very helpful thing. Mm -hmm. I, that's definitely enjoyable. I haven't used it a ton just because I like having that extra control. I'm weird like that, I suppose. But the thing that immediately caught my eye, and we're going to start with the main game first uh, before we move on to Future Connected, is the new quest system. Quests uh, were kind of hard to track in the original like you get you had your this is what you need to do this is what you need to look for but you really needed to explore and go around and remember things for where this item is found or oh i need this uh collectible and need to run around and find those and it's random what those collectibles are so it made it a lot tougher to do all of the side quests and there were a ton of side quests in xenoblade but they're worth doing because it basically prevents you from having to grind gameplay, like in battle, because you get experience, you get AP for your abilities, you get uh, cash, you know, this is how you move forward, and it's just the most efficient way to do it. You get a bunch of items that you might not have otherwise. And thankfully, thankfully, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition adds a quest tracker feature. And when I say tracker, I mean tracker. There is a, a nice white exclamation point showing where the uh, where quests are uh, you have a much wider view of the map uh, that will show them and you can change the time up so like okay here's daytime here's nighttime here's all the quests let me grab those and hey after you grab those quests there are red exclamation points on the current map you're on showing exactly where things are so if you need to kill a certain monster there's the red exclamation showing you where that monster is going to be you need a specific collectible it'll highlight that specific collectible because it's not random in the game per se it's always predetermined what you're going to get and because of that they can say okay this one is the item that you need and the same thing if you need a specific item from a monster they'll highlight that monster but let's say you want to get even more granular with that you can track specific quests and now then they'll be highlighted blue and boom you can just get directly led to it even with a little dotted line that shows you exactly how to travel to that point on the map it is extremely user friendly and basically i was able to do every quest that i could come across in uh colony nine and uh all the way up to finally reaching uh, Gower Plains, and I talked to Chugga Conroy a little bit to get a comparison, like, how long did it take you in the main game to do this? And I came in about three to four hours less than what he did, knowing what wow. he's doing, because I of this quest system. It is shaved off so much time, so in my 30 hours doing about every quest I could, uh, I have reached Aerith Sea, and I, I, I forget how that compares, but it really just does quicken the pace of the game. I remember when you brought Xenoblade Chronicles to, the, I think it's the 2011 uh, Game of the Decade debates, and the one thing that we were sort of grilling you on was the side quests, because they were just such a hindrance on an otherwise fantastic game. But everything is better about them, even the menus. I, I gotta say, this is probably the clearest menu navigation a Monolith Soft game has had. They are so clear and, and, and intuitive. And that extends to maps as well. Like, in the original Xenoblade Chronicles, I was capturing some footage for one of the trailers, 
and just going into the map to find out where you are is really cumbersome because you have to go into the quick travel menu which means opening up the menu going to the map loading up the map and then you have to go to the part of the map you want to see and then you finally see where you are in that map that's a bunch of steps just to see where you are mm -hmm. whereas in the definitive edition you can just press the y button which opens up the map or you can click down on the sticks much like in xenoblade chronicles 2 and get a much bigger view that way so just seeing where you are is so much easier now mm -hmm. you will very rarely get lost. You still need to figure out how to get to certain places unless there's a quest there, but it, it's so clearly marked, and actually it changes up the way the whole uh, Collectopedia is in the original game. So, for those who haven't played the original, there are these collectibles that are uh, blue lights, and there's a specific amount in each one. If you find all of them in a category, you get an item. If you find all of them in every category, you get another special item. So it's worth getting. But a lot of a lot of them are required for side quests, so you kind of want to have them, especially for the more rare ones. And so what I would do is just wait till I actually had an entire line and then place them in in the original game. But with Definitive Edition, because they're tracked a lot of the times, I'm just popping them in as it goes because I'm like, I don't want to miss out on the ability to easily track them. Like, especially if like a quest is for this one that I haven't gotten yet. Oh, you better believe the first one I grab is going right into it. And there have been times where the entire map just runs out of that kind. So I leave, come back and boom, they're back there again. It is so much easier to get what you need for the side quest and makes it a much uh, quicker experience and going through all of this. It's it's really a good time. And there's some pretty big changes to just navigation in general as well. I remember in the original game you're basically following that arrow most of the time, whereas that's more or less been taken down to the dotted line on the map now. So instead of just following that arrow around, I believe that's more or less gone now, right? Yeah, pretty much. It really is just a cleaner experience. And I did debate, like, I'm, I'm still wondering if it maybe takes away from the explorative aspect of it but these levels are so big and there's so much to do and there's so many quests that i think it balances out uh because it's still very possible to miss things and for example uh, i've reached you know the colony six reconstruction those are still not tracked you still need to track those down yourself so it's not like everything has been made super easy in order to find that kind of thing but it is there it is a lot simpler and uh, and you mentioned how the menus are just the clearest they've ever been, and yeah, the, the menu are, is has been redone, looks great, and it, it's just a good-looking game. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going into this expecting a visual and audio remaster, which it absolutely is, but from a gameplay perspective, the changes here make it very hard to go back to the original versions. Um, I played it. I played through it basically on the new 3DS. I played a little bit on the Wii, and I didn't play the entire thing until the new 3DS version came oh, out. Wow. So going from that tiny 240p screen to a full 1080p display is such a massive jump. Uh, and like, visually, this does look stunning. Um, when, you, when you have them side by side with the original Xenoblade, it's crazy how much of a jump the lighting is, the textures are, the models. Uh, it's a miraculous jump, but it does still feel like Xenoblade a lot of the time, mm -hmm. just with like small little tucks um, made to make the gameplay a bit more pleasant. Yes, it's it's visually better, but if you're expecting like a completely recorded voiceovers or reworked character animations, those are not in here. They pretty much still jump. I think they've been changed slightly for a lot of the character animations for like climbing and jumping, but they still kind of have that weird look to them that, that yeah. you know, everybody remembers Shulk's jump and how that looks in the game. <laughs> that is still kind of here and it's a little smoother, but the way the characters move and animate, they look better, but they they're still have that kind of stiffness that the original had. So it's not like it's completely reworked. This is basically a better set of graphics overlaid onto what came before. It just, it looks prettier, but it still feels like a basic game. Like, one of the things I always laughed about with the original Xenoblade was whenever you see them walking in a cutscene where they seem to be taking these huge steps, but they're barely going anywhere, and that's still here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> still at the same foundation as the original. Um, but one thing I did notice, and I know this will disappoint quite a lot of people, is the handheld performance is still very much in line with Xenoblade Chronicles mm -hmm. 2. So I basically, when I first booted up the game, it starts off with that attack with the mech on. And that's a very stressy area. Tons of character models, lots of explosions. And just opening the game and having that be your first impression in handheld mode isn't the best first impression, because it's quite blurry. 
Um, playing in docked, it's fine. But in a handheld mode, things just do get quite severe at times. Uh, I wouldn't say that's the common... Uh, I wouldn't say that's, like, the average, though. Yeah. Because when you're just on the field, when you're exploring, when you're fighting, as a whole, it still looks pretty good. But when the game gets intense, handheld quality does drop. I haven't played uh, in handheld too often just because, you know, I need to record everything and keep track of it all. It stinks that it's like that for handheld, but not unexpected. But it's also, this is the type of game I do want to play on my big TV, you know? this It is such... It's so beautiful and there's so much to see that I want to really feel like I'm in that world and I can't really get that on handheld. So it doesn't bother me too much. Uh, even though it's grounded in the world of the Wii, it's still crazy the Wii could produce this. Because there are oh, moments yeah. when you're looking around and you just see everything around you, all the geometry, all the cliffs. Uh, it, it's crazy the Wii could produce this in the first place and it's never looked this good. It is gorgeous. Like, every new area I go to is just a visual tr- treat. The Satoro Marsh, the Frontier Village, uh, Aerith Sea, reaching that. It's all beautiful. It's like kind of how you remember these places look. Mm. And, you know, it, it has that upgrade that really makes them pop. And, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is for the most part, that's the big changes to Xenoblade. There's a few things I can't talk about, but the, the last thing I can talk about is uh, one of the big things about the original Xenoblade is every piece of equipment you put on affected how your characters looked. And there's actually an option now to have cosmetic items always be there. So if you always want Shulk in his default outfit or matching with whatever you're wearing, that is possible. As long as you have the piece of equipment, it is possible to change that for every character and have them set for uh, cosmetic reasons. So if you want every, the, all, every, all the characters running around in bathing suits and bikinis, go for it. <laughs> you know, you can totally do that as long as you have those items. So I, I think that's a small tweak that a lot of people are going to enjoy uh, just changing up because, you know, it can look like a little bit of a mismatch. But I also thought that was, that was kind of the charm of the... Uh, original Xenoblade, so I have actually haven't messed with it too much. Yeah, you never have to say goodbye to Shirtless Dunban. He'll be there the entire adventure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one big thing apart from the visuals, though, is also the soundtrack, as I, I believe every single track has been re-recorded, and they sound incredible. Oh, they are wonderful. You get into a new area, and you can't wait to hear it, and it, it pumps in, and you're just like, Yes, like Colony 9 or, of course, Gower Plain, the Satoral Marsh at Night, all sounds so rich. And, I mean, it was awesome before, but just having these remasters uh, in there uh, really adds a punchiness to it that I enjoy. And, it, like I said, it just feels like a definitive edition. I, I never um, considered the original tracks to be poor. They, they always sounded good. But when you, you can switch back and forth between the old and new. And when you do so, I think you just appreciate how far it's come. Everything just feels fuller. Every single track, especially those heavy orchestral tracks, they just feel like they have a lot more energy behind them now. Um, I, I haven't come across one where I prefer the original so far. They all just sound really good. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I can't complain whatsoever. It all, it all sounds so good. So, I mean, you know, I can't give a review yet, but if you already like the original, you're gonna like Definitive Edition. <laughs> There's nothing mm-hmm. that I've seen here that's like, oh, this is a blemish. But uh, let's move on to Future Connected because that's the new content. Let's say you've played the original to death and you just have no interest in playing it. You can, of course, jump right into Future Connected. And I only have four hours to talk about as far as gameplay-wise. But there are some interesting changes here. There's the the differences. For one, you only have Shulk and Melia uh, to start with as far as the original uh, cast. But you do have two new Napon that join your group as well. Kino and Nene. And... It's not like they're a brand new character, though, because one acts like Ryan, one acts like Sharla. So basically, you have Ryan and Sharla in your party. For the most part, combat is exactly the same. You start out around level 60, uh, you are running around, you have all these high-level monsters, and it's combat at the beginning is going to feel exactly the same. The big change this time around, though, is... The Pawn Spectres is how they, what they call them. <laughs> so eventually, around the, the Bionis shoulder, you will find these uh, Napon that were sort of surveying the land. But they all have issues. But once you save them and help their issues, they'll actually join your party. And they'll the ones are set for debuffs, some are set for attack, and some are set for healing. So they'll actually be buffing and healing and 
you know, doing everything they can for your party. So it's well worth finding as many as you can. And I think there's around 13 or so, 12 or 13. And it just makes you stronger. But once you have one of each, this is actually the new element because there's no longer any chain attacks. Instead, we have this Nopon group where they, you choose whether you want to be do a big attack, you want to choose whether you do a bunch of healing, or if you want to really debuff the enemy, and they'll do a different thing that attacks the enemy and you time it along with it, and it does a lot of damage. It's basically the, uh, the change, and it still has that sort of same effect as the chain attack where if you're in certain conditions, you can extend it and choose another set of Nopon to do not only debuffs, but strength. So you can weaken them and then hit them hard if you feel like you've matched up enough. So there's still a bit of strategy to it, but it's not an entirely new battle system. This isn't like Torna. Yeah, that, that claim was kind of overblown. I think it came from a translated Japanese card. Um, it's definitely different, but the actual battle commands and the actual battle system itself is pretty much identical. Yeah, it's not really any major changes, and I've been sticking to Melia because Melia, you kind of have to have control yourself, otherwise the computer doesn't really do that great. That's another thing to note is that the AI hasn't really been improved from what I, from what I can tell. They're still yeah. pretty much the same. Yeah, which is a shame, because as you were saying, the AI just can't handle Melia. And I remember uh, I basically stuck as Shulk for most of the original, up until a certain boss which pretty much required Melia, and the AI just could not handle it. But um, speaking of Melia though, what's interesting about her is I'd say she's the main character of Future Connected. Oh, absolutely. And the game even starts off uh, as default, you controlling her. Like, you're not controlling Shulk as default. Melia is the, I guess, the lead party member. This really is her story. I have, I'm, I'm not going to talk about any specifics. Let's just say it starts with the end of Xenoblade, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So <laughs> you really, if you've never played it before, you need to play the original first because they refer to a lot of the big twists. They t refer to, again, the ending. Uh, there's a lot of that character development there, uh, mentioning characters, because Nene and Kino are the kids of Ricky. So that's how they're involved in there and have that connection. So it's one of those things you really do need to have that knowledge of the original if you're going to enjoy this to its fullest, unless you don't care about the plot at all, which, okay, but you still, it's it's a little different. The other big gameplay change I say is there used to be all these mining fonts around where you could get these uh, crystals that you could then forge into gems that you slotted into your equipment that would change, like, it would increase your defense or attack or cause this debuff potentially uh, on enemies, that kind of thing. They've kind of cut out the middleman here where when you draw from the fonts, you just get the gems. So you don't need to worry about any of the forging or anything like that. It's just... Bam, you have the gems, choose what you have. But they also don't have as much equipment this time around. Uh, it's mainly, you get them from uh, uh, rare drops as uh, from enemies, uh, you get them from quests, and you can buy some. But there's, there, it's not like they're just, here's new equipment, here's new equipment, like in the main game. So that is a bit of a change as well. It, it feels, honestly, it feels like a DLC pack. Like you, what you'd expect there. Like, all right, here's extra story. Here's the DLC. And you don't have to play the original, but you can still enjoy it. And it, it feels like that is the best way I can describe it. And the shoulder, that's not connected to any other part of the world, right? I, I think this is completely separate mm. to anything else on Bionis. Yes, this is... There's only two things that you can explore, at least as of yet, in Future Connected. And that is the Bionis shoulder and Alchemoth. And uh, even Alchemoth, I really didn't spend a lot of time in when I went there for story reasons. But the main draw is the Bayana shoulder. And this is a really cool area. It, it seems to take advantage of the new quest system much more so than the original game. Because it seems structured around it. There's a lot of quests that, rather than one thing in this area that you need to do, it's actually spread out across the entire shoulder. And a lot of them you need to have certain levels if you're going to get past the monsters, unless you're really good at sneaking, which, if you can do that, you I've done it in the past, but you de you definitely need to be aware of what's around you, uh, and it makes it a little bit more complex. Another big thing is that there are multiple levels to the shoulder, where there's like higher points and there's lower points, but unlike the main game, it's not the map doesn't show this as multiple levels. It's all just one flat level. So 
it requires you to explore a little more to figure out how to reach the higher points or the lower points. And it's not that difficult, but it's, you know, a little overwhelming. Like, okay, where did we go this way? And you're trying to figure out the map. Once you got that down, again, I've only played four hours. It's really simple to figure out where to go. And it's just a joy to explore the, the shoulder because uh, there's some really interesting locales. It seems like a mismatch of certain elements from across Xenoblade. But the other big thing is that there's no new enemies, at least not yet. These are all enemies transplanted from other sections and just like, all right, you remember these guys? All right, they're here. <laughs> these guys are here too. So again, it has that DLC feel to it. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to play more because the shoulder in and of itself is super interesting because it was cut content of the original. It was planned to be in there. And instead of sort of putting it back in the story, they've made a whole new area out of it. And I'm interested to see how much life there is in this. Because um, you've played it for four hours, but a game like Torna can be finished in around 25 hours or 30 hours. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious, will it have that length or will it be more like a chapter than a full-on game? I suppose we'll see when we play more of it. Mm -hmm. But another thing is, in your short time with it, do you feel like Future Connected is warranted? Because they're giving Shulk and Melio another story here, which was pretty much wrapped up in the original. Um, and I, I imagine this isn't a question we can definitively answer yet, but does it feel justified thus far? That's a tough one to answer, because story-wise, not a lot has happened. Uh, you're getting setups for certain things, but it's never really been expanded upon yet. It has the potential to be. I can see if they can really dive into Melia's character and maybe what's going on in the future, they can show... I think they can make this worthwhile, but as of right now, it's hard to say. But the, here's the, that's the thing with Xenoblade, is like, you can get to the end and all of a sudden they can throw something crazy at you that makes everything, co you know, connected and blow your mind. So I don't want to write it off yet. Uh, that said, I have explored the majority of the shoulder. There's uh, one section in particular and a few smaller, uh, like, uh, ruin areas that I can't reach yet. Uh, that I feel will be part of the story once I get there. But I think I've explored most of the shoulder other than that those few sections. And it makes me think that the entire game, unless they are just really running us all over the place in multiple and multiple areas several times over, my gut feeling is that this is probably going to be 10, 15, maybe 20 hours long. I don't think it's going to be super mm -hmm. long. The, the title's definitely interesting. Future Connected. Like, that, that could imply anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I saw some comments in a recent trailer as well. Um, Melia had a line from Future Connected, and people are confused whether that's Jenna Coleman, who played uh, Clara in Doctor Who and was also um, Melia in the main game. And as far as I can tell, I think it is. <laughs> but of course, this is recorded 10 years after her original role. So I think, think her voice might have changed a tiny bit, but... For the most part, it definitely sounds like Jenna Coleman. I will say that the, both Shulk and Melia do sound... You, know, you can definitely tell they're older. Thankfully, it's a year later, so you can kind of write it off because of that. I mean, this is definitely Adam Howard How to back. It's for Shulk, there's no doubt in my mind. Jenna Coleman, it's a little deeper, so it's a little harder to tell for me. I don't know if it's actually her. Uh, I need to get to the credits to confirm whether or not she actually did come back. If they did get her back, that's kind of amazing. Of course, I don't know what she's done yeah. after Doctor Who, so I'm not sure if she's in... I think she played Queen Victoria in uh, in some shows. Oh, wow. So she's definitely still got a good career going. Yeah. I remember being a bit confused at the start because there's one line where it sounded very off-kilter for her, and then the next line was exactly like Jenna Coleman. So either they've got someone who can impersonate her very well, or things have just changed in 10 years. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one. It's something I have to, you know, beat the game and see the cast list to be uh, mm -hmm. be sure completely. But overall, I, I'm very happy with what I've played so far. Looking forward to playing more, beating Future Connected. Uh, I don't know if I can beat the originals that I played in time, but I don't think they're going to be throwing anything that new at me at this point. I think I've seen pretty much all the new stuff that I can at least talk about so far. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling good about this. You know, I think fans coming back to this are going to really enjoy it, uh, especially the new stuff. And I think people who have not experienced it and just came into the series with two will enjoy seeing where it all began. And I, I think this is this is a very solid release that will definitely keep you busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Xenoblade's never really been given a chance. Not the first one. I mean, it released in very late into the Wii's life cycle had a crazy localization process, and then 
when it when it finally had its chance with Shulkers in Smash, they ported it to the new 3DS exclusively. Like <laughs> this game has had the worst luck. And uh, now that 2's performed very well, I have a feeling that fans of 2 are definitely going to migrate over to this one. Mm-hmm. Especially as there's no other games right now, so... You know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it, it's it's very solid. The battle system is, you know, definitely different from 2, but some people prefer it. And uh, once you get the hang of it, it's really not that bad. Uh, it's, you know, you get that idea involved. And, hey, if you've played 2 before, you get a little bonus at the beginning of uh, extra 100,000 gold. <laughs> so, you know, oh, yeah. that's nice. So, that's nice, yeah. Those little present for you so yeah otherwise those are kind of the major points of uh Zenblade chronicles definitive edition that we can actually talk about yet all right well i guess that's about it for now then mm-hmm. i'd say so okay well if you guys enjoyed this then of course be sure to subscribe for a lot more Xenoblade chronicles definitive edition coverage i mean a lot more <laughs> uh, and until then thank you for watching until next time everyone bye